Okay, I think this is the place. Pull over here, Sam. All right. Are you sure this is legal, Joy? Of course she isn't. This is a national historic location. She's been a menace to the preservation of the national treasures for this entire wild goose chase. So are you staying in the van then, Flora? Are you kidding? I wouldn't miss this. Let's go find some treasure. This isn't a quest to find a lost city of gold or some crusader's hoard, Flora. It's an archaeological study, hopefully leading to the discovery of objects of high value. Are we talking historical value, monetary value? Both, I suppose. It's a treasure hunt, and we aren't looking for treasure. So why are we here? Well, according to the clues I found on the back of the Articles of Confederation... Confederation? It means when small groups decide to join as one big group. Anyway, the clues have said that the artifacts we're looking for are through this door. But this is a Lincoln Memorial. It was only finished a hundred years ago. How would the Founding Fathers ever think to hide something here a century before the Civil War? It's an imaginary adventure. Things don't have to make sense for it to be fun. Besides, when did you become such a history expert? Let's bring ahead Miss Granger. She makes sure everyone knows about American history. Or else. Okay, so we're here at the door. Looks like there's a code to unlock it. Okay, let's go through the obvious solutions. Try 1492. Nope. 1776? Not it. 1812? Are you just trying important dates in American history? Makes sense to me. It's a national memorial. If you were going to use a famous date for a code, this would be the place to do it. Yeah, but if it makes that much sense, then it probably would be too easy for just anyone to figure it out. Yeah, but not just anyone knows their history like us. Try 1809. Mm, Nothing. Well, while you two are trying to figure it out, I'll go watch for security guards and listen to the radio. So, yeah, like I said, Mr. Jacobs, the movie made no sense. Secret maps and clues showing ways to riches untold, hidden all over historical documents. Everyone knows there's no such thing as secret treasures hidden all over America. No. Well, of course there isn't. Stop it. You're not fooling anyone. I didn't say a thing, Sam. If anything, I was agreeing with you. Yeah, yeah. So where is everyone? Usually there's at least a couple of kids here by now. I'm not sure. They're probably out enjoying their summer while they can. (laughs) I wouldn't be surprised if they showed up right about... Hey, Sam. Hey, Mr. Jacobs. Not bad. It's kind of a cliche at this point. Uh, what's going on? Just something Sam and I were talking about. How are you two doing this morning? Pretty good. You know, just trying to get the most out of what's left of our summer. Yup. We might head over to the pool later. I thought we were talking about getting ice cream. Yeah, we'll see how hot it gets. Until then, we had a question for you, Mr. Jacobs. A question? What kind of a question? A Bible question. Yeah, so Flora and I went to a Bible study last Wednesday, and it was really fun. That sounds like fun, Joy. What section of the Bible did you study? They were just starting the book of Isaiah. Last week was going through chapter 2. Hmm, it's been a while since I've read through Isaiah. What's that chapter about? It starts out how peaceful and good things are going to be for God's people. And then it changes to how they haven't been following God, and then how God's going to wipe everything out. That's why we thought we should come to you and ask what it was all about. Yeah, we got lost really quick. It does sound kind of complicated for kids to be reading. Maybe a little. But I might be able to help you girls understand a little better. Let me go get a Bible and you can show me where you're getting stuck. Great! And we'll listen to the radio till you get back. Welcome to a moment of etiquette. I'm Reginald Berkeley. Dinner time is a family favorite all over the world, and you can do your part to help get things ready by setting the table. It's not hard at all, as long as you remember the tricks of the trade. Firstly, the plate goes on the table in front of each guest's place. You want to make sure that it's not hanging off the edge, but you also want to make sure that it's not too far away from your guest to reach it. Uh, That would be silly. Once you have the plates on the table, it's time for the silverware. 
You want all of these to be placed beside the plate, pointing away from the edge of the table so your guests can easily pick them up by the handles. As for on which side of the plate they go, just count the number of letters in their name. Five letters go on the right, four letters on the left. For instance, spoon, S-P-O-O-N. Five letters, which means spoons go on the R-I-G-H-T. Now, if you are eating with chopsticks, those have a special place at the top of the plate, pointing right to left. Lastly, the cup or glass goes above the knife and spoon on the right side of the plate. And do remember to fill each glass with water. There you have it, the polite and proper way to set the table. Thank you for joining me today, and I hope to see you again soon for a moment of etiquette. All right, I'm back. So where was the passage that was giving you trouble, girls? Isaiah chapter 2. Hmm. All right, that would be after Psalms. Isaiah 2, right. I can see already this is a pretty big chapter, and I won't be able to explain everything in here. You won't? But you're Mr. Jacobs. You know all there is about the Bible. (laughs) I wish that were true, Flora. But even if it was, it would take a long time for me to go through every part of this chapter. But instead, I'll teach you how you can find the answers to your questions yourselves. You mean the internet? (laughs) Well, (laughs) that is a pretty good tool, Joy. But I'm thinking of something that you can use at any time, anywhere, to explain a lot of what the Bible has to say. You mean besides have you tell us? Well, I'm happy to talk about the Bible, Sam, but there comes a point where it's important to pass on the tools I've learned so you can learn for yourselves and teach other people. Okay, we get it. So what's the secret? All right, the thing I use to understand the Bible is something called context. I think I've heard you talk about that before a long time ago. Great, but what is it? If I'm not mistaken, context means using what's around something to explain why it's there. That's basically the idea, but another important part of context is to know what the thing is that you're looking at. Okay, confused already. (laughs) Hang in there, Joy. In this case, we're looking at a chapter in the Bible, but there are different kinds of writings in the Bible. Really? Like what? Well, to name a few, there's history writings that are all about the facts of what happened in Bible times. Then there's poetry. Writings that use flowery descriptions to explain what God is like. And prophecy. Writings that are God's messages to his people to tell them something important. And I'm guessing that because Isaiah was a prophet, this would be a prophecy writing? Exactly. So now we know what it is. A prophecy. But who is it talking to? The Israelites? Close. But if we look at the first chapter of Isaiah, it tells us that these things were said to the kingdom of Judah during the reign of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, the kings of Judah. Great, but I don't know anything about those guys. (laughs) Yeah, I can't say that those names mean much to me either. Eh, they're not the most famous names in the Bible for sure. But if you look back in the historical writings of the second kings around chapters 15 and 16, you can find them in there and you can see what was happening in those times. A lot of idol worship and wars were making the kingdom of Judah a difficult place to live. And so God told his prophet Isaiah to bring a message that he was going to bring peace to their land. But first, they needed to stop being proud and only worship him. Whoa, I get it now. Yeah, it's starting to make sense. But do you think you could explain this whole context thing some more? I don't know if I really understand it. Well, I don't know if I have a proper drama script for the topic, but I'll see what I can find. You'll find something. In the meantime, we'll listen to the radio. And now, from the garage of Lionel Jacobs comes the literary drama, The Light Bulb, a poetic explanation of the word context. Picture, if you will, a light bulb, not special in any way. It's round and white with a screw on end and lights up bright as day. With this light bulb, I can see, so I can read my book. Without the bulb, I'd have no light, and how dark my room would look. Now take this bulb out to the street and hang it on a wire. 
put it next to other bulbs, one lower, another higher. With those three bulbs, it becomes easy for drivers like me to know when I need to hit my brakes, when to stop, and when to go. Next, take the bulb and make it flash, then put it on a van. Looks like there's an ambulance. I'll pull over where I can. Put the light up on a tower, way up in the sky, and with its brightness, let it flash a hundred stories high. That light now helps us pilots when it's flashing red, because we know that this light means warning, object ahead. If you then take this light bulb out in the city sights and put it on a big sign among some other lights, it's a thing us actors dream of to be known with glitz and fame. It's really, really special for those lights to spell your name. There are many other meanings that light bulbs can earn. From the studio is on the air to I'm making a left turn. To Merry Christmas, or I had a thought, or press here for some power, or here's the elevator as it's going up a tower. The thing that changes meanings of words, thoughts, and objects is a special little concept that people call context. Context is an important thing that hides behind the scenes. It's how where something is can change just what it means. Like saying a thing to one person can mean something else to another. Like saying no to strangers. Or saying no to your mother. So when it comes to Bible verses, we all have to understand to whom the words were written and who did God command. So if you find the Bible says things no one expects, try to use other verses to put it in context. Looks like there's going to be some more questions headed your way, Mr. Jacobs. Yeah, the girls do have that thoughtful look about them. What did you think of the drama script, Sam? It wasn't much of a drama. I mean, there were characters, I guess, but no real storyline. It didn't even end with a moral or an explanation. It was something new I was trying. I figured the whole script was the explanation, so it seemed a little silly to give the lesson twice. I suppose. Mr. Jacobs, I have a question about what we've been talking about. All right, Flora, what's up? When you helped us earlier, you knew right where to go to find the context for that chapter in Isaiah. But how did you know? It's because he cheated. He's got the whole Bible memorized, so of course he knows exactly where to look. <laughs> well, I do know my way around the Bible, it's true, but it doesn't take a Bible whiz to figure out context. When I come to a verse that I don't understand, I usually go back a few chapters or even to the very beginning of the book and see where the writer is coming from. Usually, books of the Bible begin with a little introduction telling us why or to whom the book was written, and that gives us a good place to start. And I have a Bible that has little notes that go along with the verses that help me know the context by showing me other verses that are talking about the same thing in people. Those are certainly a big help. Okay, so here's my question. Okay, go ahead, Joy. All right. So, I'm pretty sure I'm not an Israelite or a Jew, and I'm even more sure that I'm not living 4,000 years ago in the land of Israel. I would say you're probably on the right track, with the last one at least. Right. So, what I want to know is, if the Bible was written to Israelites or Jews in the Promised Land thousands of years before any of us were born, then how can we act like it's written to tell us how to live? It seems we don't have the context to read this in the way it was supposed to be read. That's a really good question, Joy. And although the world has changed a lot, even in just the last 50 years, God hasn't. Verses like Hebrews 13.8 and James 1.17 assure us of that fact. And because He never changes, we know that the things that hurt Him in Bible times can still hurt Him today. And though Jesus dying for us changed the way we can be close to Him, God still wants us to love Him with all our hearts and love others the way we love ourselves. And even though the culture doesn't work the same way as back then, God tells us in Matthew 5.18 and 2 Timothy 3.16 that the whole Bible still is important and tells us how to live, how not to live, and who our God is. And that's why you've got it memorized. Exactly. Thanks for taking the time to answer our questions, Mr. Jacobs. Today was a little different, and I think next time we go to the Bible study, we'll have a better idea of what everyone's talking about. Glad to hear it. Uh, speaking of going somewhere, do you want to go to the pool now, Joy? I thought you wanted to get ice cream. I'm not hungry anymore. Well, then I guess I better get my swimsuit and sunscreen. Yeah, see you later, Mr. Jacobs. Bye, Sam. Bye, Flora. 
Ha <laughs> ha, it's never a boring Saturday around here, that's for sure. Yeah, what are you going to do when all of us grow up and move on? <laughs> well, when the world runs out of kids who need to learn about God, I guess I'll have to figure something out, won't I? I guess you will. Could you do me a huge favor, Sam? Yeah, sup? Would you mind turning off the radio for me? I suppose. 